Hello, everyone, and welcome. My name is Michael McNutt, Director of Events and Education for Weedy, and thank welcome to the Road to Interoperability series, the spotlight focusing on prior authorization, payer, provider, and patient impact. It's my pleasure to welcome and introduce Robert Tennant, Vice President of Federal Affairs with Weedy. Thank you, Michael. Let me add my welcome. Uh, this is a continuation of the Weedy series, what we're calling the Road to Interoperability and Prior Authorization, really doing a, a deep dive into this really important final rule that has come out from CMS. So uh, I'll walk through a, just, just a, few, a few slides if you haven't uh, uh, participated in this series before, just give you a brief overview of Weedy. Uh, we were formed back in 1991 by the uh, Secretary of the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services, Dr. Lewis Su Sullivan. He um, uh, called into his office, the leaders in healthcare, and said, we've got to make healthcare data exchange more efficient. And so he charged them with developing uh, some recommendations. And those uh, reports, uh, from 1992 and 93 were folded into legislative language that we now know as HIPAA. So we have worked ever since uh, through a very collective and collaborative environment uh, to try to solve some of the vexing challenges uh, facing healthcare data exchange. We do our work through our work groups, our forums, our discussions, uh, and we were named in HIPAA as an advisor uh, to the secretary of HHS. So as I said, we do a lot of our work through our work groups. We have 18 work groups, sub work groups, and task groups. Uh, and you can see here a wide variety of topics are covered. Uh, if you're in, if you're interested, if you are a Weedy member, I encourage you uh, and remind you that all of your employees are all also considered Weedy members, and they can participate in these work groups, sub work groups, and task groups. Next slide. So just as a reminder, if you uh, didn't catch the first three, uh, they're all available on YouTube, and the links are here. Uh, we had a wonderful overview of the regulation from CMS on the 19th. We did a deep dive in, into the payer-to-payer API on February 8th. We switched gears and discussed the patient access and provider access API. And now we're moving into the prior authorization uh, components of the reg regulation. So uh, today we'll hear uh, perspectives from uh, payers, providers, and patients. And then on March 4th, uh, we'll hear from um, EMR vendors, uh, and also hear from early adopters and pioneers, and you'll want to learn uh, about how they've uh, successfully implemented a APIs. And then finally, we're going to um, really do a laser focus on the smaller entities that are impacted uh, by the regulation. On March 21st, we'll uh, focus on small providers, and then small payers will be um, the topic for uh, for a for eight, April 8th. And as a reminder, uh, all these uh, are free for uh, members of Weedy. Next slide. We couldn't uh, produce this type of series without the wonderful support of our vendor partners, EdFX and, and MCG. Uh, we've got links here, and I would strongly encourage you if you are uh, interested in um, or required uh, to, to support the provisions of the final rule, look to these van, van, uh, vendors to help you make that transition to APIs. Next slide. And I wanted to do a real uh, shout out to our board chair, Ed Hafner. Uh, he is uh, the co-chair of our emerging uh, tech uh, work group. And he and his colleagues are hosting what we're calling the post game show. So it's an opportunity to do an even deeper dive into these issues based a lot on the conversations that we'll have today. So uh, if you're interested in getting involved in this work group, uh, please contact uh, Sam Holvey. Uh, next slide. And as many of you know, uh, Weedy was instrumental in assisting the industry uh, implement version 4010 and 5010, as well as the ICD-10 code set. And we're planning a similar uh, type of effort 
with the the interoperability and prior authorization final rule through things like like education you're you're experiencing today uh work products white pay for industry guidance we'll be conducting surveys uh, that will be identifying a return on investment in particular that will be important because not all um, entities are covered under the rule we'll also uh, spotlight early adopters and ultimately we, we really want to make recommendations to cms perhaps for guidance for um, potential frequently asked questions and the like and then most importantly, we're going to create uh, an online community forum to allow uh, the, the industry to submit questions. Um, some will try to answer some. We may look to, uh, uh, to the standards development organizations for assistance, and some may be uh, filtered directly over uh, to CMS. Uh, next slide. And again, what we're uh, trying to do with um, the online community forum is uh, provide uh, an opportunity uh, for you to uh, you know ping your your colleagues if you've got an issue or a question. This is a perfect venue uh, to get that addressed. So again, um, you know we want to keep it to uh, specific questions to to the uh, final rule, but um, all questions that are relevant to that rule are welcomed. And with that, I'll uh, go to the next slide. So to talk about today's agenda, um, we're going to do a quick um, uh, weedy welcome, followed by uh, an overview of the rule by our good friends at CMS. And then we'll do a technical overview of the APIs. Uh, then we're going to turn to uh, our expert panel to talk about uh, the rule from their particular perspective. And then at th uh, three, we'll uh, hand it over to EdFX, and they've got a wonderful presentation that you'll want to hear from. Uh, I won't go through all of our speakers. We'll allow them to introduce themselves a little bit later. But with that, um, oh yeah, I, I don't want to forget, this is a wonderful opportunity for you to engage with our speakers today. So take advantage of the chat feature to ask questions or to raise it, it to raise issues and most importantly uh, we will be sending the slides and recordings to you after the event so you can share them uh, with your colleagues with that uh, i've got the distinct pleasure of introducing our our first speakers uh, lorraine Dew is senior policy advisor for cms and she'll be joined by her colleague shanna hart Hartman, who is Standards and Implementation Lead at, at CMS. Uh, thank you, ladies, so much for your willingness to share your expertise and tell us a little bit more about this final rule. All right. Uh, thank you uh, again for uh, inviting the Health Informatics and Interoperability team once again uh, to speak to Weedy about our interoperability and prior authorization final rule. We hope you are not getting tired of us, um, but we do always learn from the questions that come up at these sessions. We also find it very, very uh, beneficial to participate. As Rob said, you're going to be hearing from me and Shanna about the prior authorization policy provisions of the final rule. And we also look forward to the insights that we're gonna be hearing from the uh, excellent panel that Weedy has put together for you today. Um, if you go to the next slide, please. This is a disclaimer. Uh, this is kind of a new slide, actually, um, just to put together because um, as we are going to be talking about the provisions of the final rule, um, and the, this is guidance that's directly from the rule, it's only, you know, that information that we have from that. And so um, what you're hearing about is, you know, what we can provide to you and then any policy guidance that we have based on the questions that you may ask. And so I just wanted to add this disclaimer um, for these kinds of conversations that come up because the questions that you provide to us are sometimes zingers and we have to go back sometimes and think about them uh, after we go through and, and hear them. So we may not be able to provide answers directly today, but we will get back to you either in FAQs or in guidance or in follow-up that we do with um, Weedy. So I just wanted to add that here. Uh, you can go to the next slide now. 
And again, this is a slide that um, most, if not all of you are familiar with. So the first part of these remarks are going to be just to reiterate what you have heard, but to remind you that we did release the final rule on January 17th, and it has now appeared officially in the Federal Register on February 8th. Uh, so given that it's several weeks since it did come out, I'm sure it's been dissected uh, and digested. Um, and I do have to say that, that, you know, as we've given these presentations and if we've heard other presentations that people have given, even though what we may not have presented, we've really been pleased at the response that we've gotten, both in the questions and also just the feedback that this rule is going to be a value add to industry. Um, and that's really been reassuring to us that we've um, hit the right marks in the policies that we have here. Um, it's it's demonstrating our continued commitment to interoperability, to addressing the prior authorization processes and the issues, and we're getting at the right kinds of standards that are really going to help industry move forward um, in this trajectory. So that has been um, very fulfilling to us. So we're um, the final rule is addressing patient providers, patients, and streamlining um, this process. The rule does have provisions for addressing both operational issues as well as technical issues. And we do have two compliance dates that I'll be talking about that the generally 2026 is for the operational processes and 2027 is for the technical provisions. And that was because we wanted to have additional lead time for development and testing. We knew that was important to do that and was based on comments we received um, for the proposed rule. So um, it's ultimately going to reduce the burden, um, but improve things for industry writ large. So you can move to the next slide. Again, um, this is one with which you all have familiarity, um, but the impacted payers that we have in this rule are Medicare Advantage, the state Medicaid and CHIP programs, Medicaid managed care and CHIP managed care entities, and the qualified health plans on the federally facilitated exchanges. That's a very broad swath of organizations that are impacted and will have impact on many, many providers and many patients to improve this prior authorization processes. And the provisions, and even though we're gonna focus on the prior authorization pieces, what you've already heard about is the patient access API, some additional policies related to that from the May 2020 final rule. We've talked to you about that in the prior session, but also on the provider access API for data exchanges between payers and providers, and then the payer to payer API, which improves communication between payers, all to improve the data electronic exchanges. And then as we've said before, we're really trying to get at this whole prior authorization bi-directional data exchange so that we included providers in this based on comments that we had received earlier that if we don't include providers in this communication, we won't really be able to maximize the full value impact of this. And Shanna is gonna be talking about the provisions related to the providers that are involved in the promoting interoperability and the, um, <clears throat> the MIPS programs for those incentives to really ensure that we can maximize the benefits of this rule. If you go to the next slide, I actually have one that's before this that you don't have, but I want to make a comment that when we talk, because we were talking about prior authorization, we had spoken to you before about patient access, provider access, and payer-to-payer -payer access APIs. The provision related to those that is uh, involving the prior authorization is because we've added a requirement that prior authorization information gets exchanged with those APIs. And that's in part because we wanted to make sure that everybody had the same kind of information about prior authorizations that had been approved, what kinds of services had been approved, so that everybody could have that data exchange of, of what had what to, to improve that level of communication between the patient, the provider, and the payer so that services weren't redundant. And I just wanted to make sure that we didn't forget what we had already talked about in those prior sessions, that now not only is information being exchanged for communication, but also specifically that prior authorization information that we're gonna be talking about today. 
And so I wanted to share, so this patient access API in the slide I have is kind of a slightly different than what you have. And I've added provider access and the patient access and the payer access that that new data requirement is about prior authorization requests and decisions that is now included in all of those APIs. And that's the reason you have this slide, mine's slightly different. I will send that to Michael so that you have the purpose of talking about prior authorization today is because that's the data piece that is new in all of these APIs across this final rule. So you can move on from uh, that slide. And now we'll talk about, about prior authorization and why that is sort of a central tenant of this final rule. So for the API, we said this is required in 2027 because we wanted to give everyone more time to really get this um, API data exchange done uh, correctly to have time for development and testing because it's so critical. So in this, we required the utilization of certain required standards to get the API data exchange going and certain recommended HL7 implementation guides. And many of you are familiar with these. It may be new for some of you, but there are three recommended implementation guides. And actually later, Shanna is going to be talking about the specific standards and implementation implementation guys, but for our purposes here, the, um, the CRD, which will say, is a prior authorization required at all? What are the coverage requirements? Is prior authorization required? If so, what do I need to move forward with getting a prior authorization done? The next uh, implementation guide is documentation templates and rules. What supporting documentation do I need to submit? And can I do that through my electronic health record and actually perform those questionnaires or those templates in my electronic health record. And so that's the DTR. And then finally, the prior authorization support or PAS, which will compile all that information in order to be able to submit that for a request and get that response back. And that comprises this API uh, for the technology to be able to submit it. And as you know, in, in concert with this final rule being released, uh, HHS also released enforcement discretion for the use of the mandated HIPAA standard. As part of our rule, we had originally said that the in order to be compliant, you also had to do the X12-278. We and the National Standards Group got a lot of comments about that requirement, that the 278 didn't really have the uptake that it uh, had from the original regulations that those required. And so now there is going to be guidance released very soon about what that enforcement discretion um, will be comprised of. But if you do not need to use it once you've implemented the API, you will not be required to also submit an X12-278 transaction. And that will also serve to decrease the burden from having to do both the API and the X12-278 transaction should you not um, choose to use them. That. And that guidance will be coming, as I said, from the National Standards Group um, very, very soon. It'll be posted on their website and we will link to it from ours as well. So that's a very this API is a very central part of our final rule. And then if you go to the next slide, the next um, central part of our policy are the processes that we um, are requiring, which will be reducing a huge amount of burden that we've heard about probably for a decade, if not more, which are these, um, oh, no, go, go back one. Yep, these are the processes. These requirements will go into effect in 2026 because they're operational. And we believe that these can be done, implemented in advance. First will be the decision timeframes, that one of the big burdens is we don't get responses timely enough, and these delays affect patient care and can be very, very deleterious. And so now we've made them so that expedited decisions have to be made within 72 hours, and standard decisions have to be made within seven calendar days. So these timeframes are now across all payers. There is one um, caveat in that for the qualified health plans on the QHPs, um, <clears throat> they will be making um, expedited decisions within 72 hours, but it's 15 days for standard decisions. And in part, that's because 
they are under tri-agencies, and so they have different authorities than the other health plans. And so right now, the QHPs, the timeframes are not applicable to them. For the second big policy piece for these um, processes are providing a specific reason for denial, regardless of the way that that denial is sent. Uh, what we've heard about a lot is we don't, when we get a denial for a prior authorization, we don't know what action to take. We don't know what to tell our patients. We don't know if additional documentation is needed. Um, they're, it's, they're very nebulous um, sets of information. Uh, and oftentimes, even if there is an appeal, then it's overturned. And so now we're requiring a specific actionable reason for denial. And that will reduce time on the phone, both for providers um, and for payers. Uh, I should also save money on that. And the, so the clarity in those denial reasons should really serve to improve this process. And we're really interested in getting feedback on how effective um, this policy is over time. And then the third piece of this um, policy uh, section is metrics, where we are requiring payers to report on the metrics for prior authorization on their websites in a, in a public way. And this will be metrics on what, what services uh, do require prior authorization, uh, how many were denied, how many were overturned on appeal. And we think that doing this is going to help um, the payers understand what their own policies and performance is, make those improvements and use that um, to make any changes that might be necessary. And will also help um, patients and providers understand um, how those services and uh, process improvements are over time. And now I'm going to turn this over to Shanna, who's going to talk about the other side of the equation, which is the providers who are obviously, you know, part and parcel of this in terms of the electronic prior authorization measures and using their EHRs in order to conduct this process. So Shanna, I'm going to turn it over to you and then you'll take us home talking about the standards as well. Sure. Thanks, Lorraine. Um, so as Lorraine mentioned, the other side of this API is um, the providers and hospitals. And this um, rule created a new measure called the electronic prior authorization. And this measure is under the health information exchange objective for MIPS eligible clinicians that report to the merit based incentive payment systems promoting interoperability performance category, as well as for eligible hospitals and critical access hospitals that report to the Medicare Promoting Interoperability Program. This measure is beginning with calendar year 2027, um, which is the performance period um, and the 2029 MIPS payment year. So 2027 performance and EHR reporting period. This measure was initially proposed as a um, numerator denominator measure, but based on public comment, it was finalized as an attestation based uh, requiring a yes, no response. In order to receive credit for the measure, the um, eligible hospital or clinician must, must um, attest yes to requesting a prior authorization electronically using a prior authorization API with data from the certified electronic health record technology for at least one medical item or service excluding drugs that was ordered during that performance period or EHR reporting period. Or they could claim an exclusion. There are two exclusions available for the measure. Um, if they do not order any medical items or services requiring prior authorization during the performance or reporting period, or only order medical items or services requiring a prior authorization from a payer that does not offer an API, those are both exclusions that could be submitted for this measure. Next slide, please. And as Lorraine mentioned earlier, um, there are standards in this role for all of the APIs, and I will just specifically mention those for prior authorization, since that's what this presentation is for. We do also have a policy that allows the use of updated versions of those standards, um, as long as that does not disrupt the end user's ability to access the data through the API and some other conditions are met. And um, next slide, please. So, we do have, as met, um, Lorraine mentioned earlier, required standards as well as recommended implementation guides. And here you can see for the prior authorization API that requires the use of the FHIR standard as well as the FHIR US Core implementation guide and the HL7 Smart App Launch Framework. 
These standards are all in line with standards um, already adopted by ONC as well. Next slide, please. And also, as Lorraine already mentioned earlier, for the prior authorization API, there are three recommended implementation guides, the DaVinci Coverage Requirements Discovery, or CRD, the DaVinci Documentation Templates and Rules, or DTR, and the DaVinci Prior Authorization Support, or PAS IG. Next slide, please. And here again in the slides is um, a list of a bunch of resources, our final rule and fact sheet, um, as well as other interoperability related rules. And on our website, we do have um, technical standards and implementation support. So please visit there where we have a lot of information around these standards, as well as implementation support for all of the implementation guides. Next slide, please. And as always, we'll get to questions today. Um, but if you do not get your question answered or you think of any after this presentation, please feel free to email us at cmsinteroperability at cms.hhs.gov. And thank you for having us. Great. Uh, Shauna and Lorraine, thank you so much. Excellent presentation. Um, we're going to turn the floor over to our good friend, Bob Dieterle. He's a CEO and owner of Enable Care, but also um, he's HL7 DaVinci uh, Project Senior Advisor and Burden Reduction Lead. So we're going to turn it over to you, Bob, uh, and we'll pull, pull your slides up. And thank you so much for sharing your expertise today. Okay. Um, can you see my slides? They look great. Yep. Okay. Um, I want to thank uh, both uh, Michael and Robert for uh, uh, asking me to participate in the uh, session uh, on prior authorization. Obviously, something very uh, near and dear to my heart. Uh, we've been working on this for quite a number of years. Um, we started out with a set of goals. Let's see if I can get on the right screen here. There we go. With a set of goals that were focused on. Uh, patients, providers, and payers, in particular on patients. What we've been trying to do through the uh, implementation or the creation of these implementation guides is to ensure that patients can get the answer they need from the payers as far as treatments, uh, diagnostics, uh, referrals that require prior authorization. The ultimate goal is to have that information in their hands before they leave the practice or before they're discharged from the hospital so that the next step in their care can be scheduled while they're in their prior step. So this is the way to go and improve care delivery. It's a way to go and increase the conversation between a, a provider and the patient uh, on both uh, uh, the nature of the next step in their care as well as the costs associated with it. For the providers, it's a way to reduce burden. Right now, they have to go and go on a portal. They have to use uh, 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 paper. They have to use fax to go and submit information, submit requests. What we're doing is try to automate the process and move it forward in the clinical workflow. So those things that can be satisfied at the time of order are done. Those things that can be satisfied as we automate the collection of information can be done. And those that require a more formal process of submitting information electronically to the uh, payer and getting a response back can also be handled. For payers, we're trying to go and improve the relationships that they have with their providers, the relationships they have with their members, and be able to improve the documentation that they require by gathering it automatically from the clinical record, not by having it sent in as a paper or uploaded to a website, but rather to have discrete data that they can then automate the review of. As Lorraine has gone through, um, and Shannon, there are really four pieces to what we're doing with prior authorization, three of which are noted in the uh, final rule. Uh, the coverage requirements discovery is where the provider at the appropriate point in clinical workflow indicates that they're preparing to do something and is asking the payer 
for information related to, I'll say broadly, coverage. Is this covered? Is it covered in network, out of network? Does it require uh, particular documentation? Does it require prior authorization? All of that can be responded to by the provider or by the payer and is annotated on that particular individual service or product that's being uh, ordered. Um, the next step is documentation, templates, and rules. If documentation is required, and we'll focus on prior authorization right now, for prior authorization, we have the ability to go and have electronic forms called questionnaires, fire questionnaires, be retrieved from the payer that are unique to that particular service or product or referral that's being ordered. They can be static questionnaires or they can be interactive questionnaires, okay? And the interactive questionnaire, you answer a question, it's returned to the payer. So you can actually walk through a very complex care plan and only hit those specific nodes that are relevant. So we don't have to have a complex cardiac care plan, for example, that may have 400 or 500 different nodes uh, represented in a questionnaire. What we can do is we can only touch the six that matter for that patient, for their condition, for that pair. And we gather the information automatically from the electronic medical record using the 21st Century Cures Act APIs. So at that point, if it's in the record, if it's structured, it can be pre-populated to answer the question so the provider doesn't have to do anything other than, if they wish, review it prior to submission. Finally, as uh, uh, Lorraine talked about prior authorization support, this is probably the single biggest change between the uh, NPRM and the final rule. Um, we built this to acknowledge the fact that at the time HIPAA required uh, submission for prior authorization to go through a 278, next 12 278. With the um, Division of National Standards uh, enforcement discretion, this will no longer be a requirement. It'll still be allowed, but it'll no longer be a requirement. So the fire bundle that is created on the prior authorization side can be sent directly to the payer and they can respond back with that bundle without needing to go through a translation or transformation in the middle. The final thing that we have as part of prior authorization support is the ability for a payer to ask for additional documentation regardless of how good we are collecting it right up front, there may be something that because of the clinical data that's associated with the, uh, the prior authorization request or information they already have, they need a question answered. They're able to come back and ask for additional information and we satisfy that by using a fourth implementation guide, clinical data exchange. This is something that allows us to collect data, allows us to use additional interactive forms uh, and submit it directly to the payer. So on the coverage requirements discovery, we talked about the high level. There are a number of things that have changed since the beginning uh, of the first iteration of the implementation guide. And just to remind people, we published an STO-1, a standard for trial use version, one of these guides a while ago. And people have been working with them and working on implementing them. Uh, we've just published a second version an SCU-2, Standard for Trial Use Version 2. Uh, these have been published this fall, and they are now available and cited in the final rule. Um, they include additional specifications for situations that weren't covered by the initial request. Uh, it includes specification for additional hooks that allow us to go and interact at different points in the workflow. And it uh, um, removes any requirements uh, for any uh, uh, included clinical data recommendations. Um, so basically, uh, we don't have to have hooks that have a bunch of information that's been gathered. You can have them yet. Uh, you can also turn around and use a token to allow the payer to get access to the record to go and uh, request information at the time of this interaction. Uh, so they can come back with a uh, anything from a, we're gonna need additional information to it's covered or not covered, uh, to um, actually authorizing it now. And with the enforcement discretion, 
the response that gets returned, which included a unique ID to say this requires prior authorization and we're indicating that everything has been met, they can actually return that and it will be considered to be the prior authorization number that can be included in the 837. We believe that's true. We'll see what happens when the final um, enforcement discretion comes out the door. Um, this is really the workflow. I'm not gonna go through all these. They'll be on the deck for you to review. I don't wanna spend a lot of time on it, but basically this takes all the guesswork out of does is prior authorization required or not? Is it covered or not? Uh, we're down now to the specific service referral um, product and the ability for the payer to come back and indicate to the provider while they're in front of the patient what the status is. Now, in some cases, they'll need more information than we have at the time of order, for example, and those things will be deferred to later in the clinical workflow. This does take advantage of what's called CVS hooks as an underlying technology. We expanded the scope of hooks that are being supported. We did this so that we could interact at the various points where prior authorization may be required, or we have other reasons as part of prior authorization workflow to allow an interaction, an automated interaction between a provider and a payer. We have the ability to interact at the time an appointment is booked. At that point, it may be that for that particular provider, uh, it requires prior authorization before they can go ahead and see the provider or get whatever service the provider is going to be offering. Uh, that can be taken care of right up front. We can also use that as a way to go and populate. And I know they've talked about this or Mark's talked about this on the uh, uh, provider access API, the ability to indicate that this patient, I now have a treatment relationship with. Your member, I have a treatment relationship with. So we can use this as a way to update the attribution list. Encounter start is a way to go and do the same thing to indicate this could happen as a walk-in. Uh, that this patient is now in a treatment relationship with a provider. It'll be up to the payer to determine whether this is a viable way of providing uh, an update to the attribution list. Uh, but it also allows you to turn around and at encounter start to go and have the payer collect the information relative to that member so they can validate that the member is actually a member of, uh, of, of you know, one of their plans. They can validate which plan it's on or which plan they're on. They can pull forward any information they already have on that particular uh, member, uh, claim submitted, et cetera, and they can pull forward any requirements or stage any requirements that they have for prior authorization or coverage or in or out of network. So this allows them all the time that's necessary between the beginning of an encounter and an order to gather and stage the information that's necessary to respond in real time. And there is a real time response requirement. We do order select as an option. Order select is a thing that when any portion of an order is entered, I'm selecting a drug that's off order select. I'm selecting uh, um, the uh, form that's off order select. I'm selecting the uh, uh, duration of the the the, uh, the therapeutic, uh, meaning I'm going to give you a, a week's worth or whatever. It sets off. This is an incredibly interactive process, and it may be appropriate. We are allowing support for it, but not requiring it. What we're doing is during order sign, there is an absolute requirement. At that point, when you're signing the order, the entire order is sent to the payer and the payer can come back and for each individual item within the order, they can respond back with what they understand to be the situation regarding that particular service referral product. Um, and then ultimately, uh, for those things that require additional information, uh, for example, who's gonna perform it, uh, when will it be performed, uh, things that are not necessarily available at the time the provider orders, uh, they can be handled after the fact in an order dispatch, uh, including revisions. Documentation and templates and rules. Um, this is the ability to fully automate or at least automate as far as possible the collection of information required for prior authorization. 
We're using fire questionnaires. Those fire questionnaires have the ability to have uh, through uh, clinical quality language, CQL, um, defined um, pre-population capability using the 21st Century Cures Act API. So they can go out and if one of the questions is, what medications are the patient on? Well, they can go out and actually interrogate in the clinical record and pre-populate that. Nobody has to interact with it. That can be done in advance. They can do the same thing for diagnoses, for prior treatments, for anything else that's in the clinical record and available through the APIs. So it'll cut the overhead of gathering information substantially. In fact, you could argue that in some cases, it'll cut the overhead entirely. In other cases, it will evolve as we move forward where more and more information becomes structured in the um, medical record and the questionnaires become better attuned to what information is available through auto population. Uh, so what, we automate the process of assembling the clinical documentation. Uh, we pre-populate based on the patient record and we allow potentially, if this is actually done while the patient's there, capture that information during the patient encounter. Uh, DTR actually can be um, initiated in a number of ways. Whoops, sorry. It can be done through the CRD client. We can have a delayed launch. In other words, the provider says, nah, I'm not going to do this. I'm going to do it later. That's fine. We have the ability to suspend it, meaning I've answered all the questions that make sense. Now I'm going to move it to my back office or I'm going to address this later. That's a relaunch. And we have the ability to launch this standalone. In other words, I'm going to collect documentation I know needs to be done for a particular purpose. I'm not using CRD, um, and I want to go and interact with a payer's uh, questionnaire. And you can do that. And we have the ability to launch it from CDEX. So CDEX can go use DTR to gather additional information at the request of PAS or as an independent request from a payer. Sorry, I'm gonna get this right. Prior authorization support. Um, this was designed around the concept that we can have an automated process for collecting the information necessary to submit a prior authorization. The information came out of DTR, for example. Uh, package it all up and automate the um, request to use a 278 to go in uh, submit a prior authorization to the payer and give back an automated response using fire within the EHR and recognizing the fact that X12 was required under HIPAA for the prior authorization transaction. With the enforcement discretion, you'll no longer have to go through the 278 if you don't need to. Uh, you may do it because you like the 278 and you want to support it or the payer supports it. Uh, but there's no requirement to do it. Uh, we believe once we see the enforcement discretion, we'll know for sure. So what's happening is this is the standard that we had created, the ability to go and translate the 278 uh, and then uh, submit it to uh, prior authorization processing on behalf of the payer uh, and the ability to go and translate it back. So on this end, we're always working with a fire bundle of one form or another. Under the enforcement discretion, that translation is no longer going to be required. You can send a fire request bundle with its attachments directly through to the pair. They can process it and they can send the bundle back. So in both cases, we have the ability to have a response to be pended. So it may turn out they can't answer the question right now. They need additional review. They need additional documentation. Um, and they can return a pended response. And we have within the implementation guide, a definition of how to submit what's called the subscription to that payer or that provider. And any prior authorization that gets pended, the payer, when they have an update to the prior authorization, will send an alert through to either the intermediary, if we're dealing with um, X12, or through to the provider, saying, I've got more information for you, the provider at that point can go out and get an updated bundle or get an updated uh, 278. So we have the ability to turn around and manage 
tended transactions and their normal life cycle. We have the ability to go and use uh, CDEX to request information. The request for information can be based on the standards that are currently in the X12. In other words, the specific codes um, or uh, the link codes that can be specified uh, either at the uh, 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 highest level to 278 or at the individual item level. Uh, we also have the ability to have a request placed through the 278 or now directly in the um, uh, fire bundle for a particular questionnaire that needs to be used to collect the information. And that can be an adaptive form that's interactive also. And by using CDEX, we have the way to go and assemble that and to submit it back to a payer's documentation endpoint that's part of the CDEX process. So we can automate the request for additional documentation. This is the overall flow, very complex. Uh, and uh, quite honestly, there's a whole lot more to it than just this. These are the major flows. We have CRD, DTR, and hazard slash CDEX. The arrows that are in pink are the arrows that go between what we would traditionally consider a provider system and a payer system. So these are the interactions that cross between provider and payer. The other arrows are here to indicate things that have to happen within the black box of a provider or the black box of a payer. And we do this so they understand all the things they need to be able to support, validate the members, uh, look up uh, um, um, uh, whether they're currently in a plan, uh, be able to get the information related to prior authorization requirements, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So this gives you the overall workflow. I'm not going to go into that. So bottom line is in burden reduction, what we're trying to do is standardize all the interactions across payers and providers for the benefit of the patient in particular. Okay, so we have one standard interaction that's always used, not one for this payer, one for this provider organization, we have one regardless of who the payer is and regardless of who the provider is. We have full workflow integration here. So we can, we can make decisions at each of the points in the workflow as to whether or not prior authorization is required and if so is it already satisfied. Uh, we have the ability to share data that's largely computable, assuming it's available in the EHR and automatically populated. And we have the ability to implement common workflow uh, expectations, and that's important. Got, regardless of who the provider is, regardless of the practice they have, regardless of the service that they deliver, they can have common workflow expectations and how they interact with payers around prior authorization. We minimize the collection of documentation by automating retrieval from the medical record for structured data. And for burden reduction, we avoid duplicate entry. You don't have to upload things to a portal. You don't have to go and fill out a form manually. And we have the ability within the structure to easily adapt to new requirements because fire is quite flexible and our implementation is exceedingly flexible that may be placed on new types of services or particular uh, specialties. So I believe that's the end of it, it is. And Michael, I'm gonna hand control back over to you. Bob, thank you so much. It was an excellent overview. We do have a few questions. Um, Karen, uh, sorry, I apologize. Uh, Janice has asked to clarify, you're saying that the ID should be included to indicate a response of no PA re required, correct? Okay, let me let me, let me me clarify that. The, for those things that require prior authorization, where that prior authorization is satisfied during CRD or during DTR, and that only works with the adaptive form, so we have an interaction going on, the payer can return an identifier that is the prior authorization number that can be put in the 837. It's only the ability to say, we require prior authorization for, it, for this, it is satisfied, here's the number. You don't have to go through PES. And um, she did have a, a follow up on that. And she said, to be clear, this is just for the X12278 enforcement discretion, not the unique 
ID on the 837, which uh, was, was new? Well, this would be up until that enforcement discretion was indicated as possible. Uh, we were looking for a way to put the unique ID in some other element than the prior authorization uh, number element. But now that with the enforcement discretion, it's our understanding that we'll be able to treat it exactly as a prior authorization number and put in the standard uh, element for prior authorization number in the 837. And uh, David, I see your hand. Yes. Hey, Robert. Hey, everybody. Thanks for joining. Good, good presentation so far. Um, Bob, quick question. What about those PAs that don't require an authorization? Is there still some sort of an ID or tracking number associated with those so that the provider can say, hey, I checked and I didn't need a prior authorization. Now my claim is denied. How do we deal yeah. with that scenario? With, yeah. Within, within the um, response coming back during CRD, there's something called uh, the uh, coverage um, information. It's an extension. It's something the payer provides. And within that, they indicate a unique identification for that service, always. They have to do it. They don't have a choice. So that is a unique identifier that can be stored as part of the patient's record, as part of that particular service or referral or whatever it happens to be. The payer can, at that point in time, say, fine, we cover this, but there's no additional requirements, in which case you'll have that information stored in your record. Uh, they can turn That's around and say, well, we cover it, but only on network without prior authorization or out of network, you'll require it. Or they can say you require additional documentation that's necessary or something else. So they can say any of those things as part of this coverage information that gets returned. The EHR is required to store that as an extension on that particular orderable. So you will both have a record of it, meaning the provider and the payer will have a record that this was requested where this was in this was indicated that I'm ordering it. You responded back with this. They both have a record of that. Great. Perfect. That, Thank you. Yeah. That will satisfy whatever documentation requirements that payers and providers <laughs> use to ensure that payment follows coverage. What gotcha. About? Perfect. Thank you. Excellent. Um, uh, Bob, Chris asks a, a question. If a provider knows that a, a prior auth is going to be needed, can they go direct to DTR without going through CRD first? Um, sure, they can. Um, and in fact, that's, that would be the uh, standalone launch. Um, the question is, why would they? Uh, given that the way this is designed, every single orderable will be sent to the payer except for those that are self-pay for example and they're going to respond back anyway and this is all behind the scenes electronic exchange so why would they not do that in fact that will probably already have been done and at that point it will indicate for that particular service here's the appropriate questionnaire so they don't have to go and try to figure it out through an interaction with the provider with a payer they already have the identity of that particular uh, questionnaire. So there's a reason you'd want to use CRD for it. If you're not using CRD at all, yes, you can go directly to DTR. Excellent. Um, I know a question that has uh, been asked a lot by providers and Richard asks it here. Um, the, the idea is with uh, the, uh, the questionnaires, um, the, the expectation is that at some point we'll get to an automated filling of the information to the, uh, the template. Uh, he asks, what is currently being worked on uh, to reduce these manual requirements? And uh, what do you see on the horizon? Well, the requirement is to support, and this is part of DTR, is to support auto population from the clinical record. So this is not an option, it's not the future. This is the requirement of implementing any of these um, 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 questionnaires, whether they're standalone or it's a adaptive form. So, you know, the authors are required to do that when it's possible. 
So we expect on day one that pre-population from the clinical record will be part of this process. You know, we've got some work going on this year to go, and this is obviously we're well before the enforcement date, to go and standardize the way that CQL works to make it easier for the questionnaire authors to go and be able to say, fine, I want to I want to know if you have a, uh, a particular um, diagnosis or condition. Here's the CQL you would use to go and pre-populate that question in your questionnaire. I need to know if you've already had an x-ray. Here's the CQL you used to pre-populate that. So our expectation is by the time we're turning this on live with between payers and providers, that at least a substantial portion of the questions in a questionnaire will be subject to pre-population. Making things never a lot be easier. Everything. And yeah. let me be clear, yeah. on day one, it will never be everything uh, yeah. for two reasons. Number one, it's going to take time to understand how to make all this work in the workflow uh, within a questionnaire. And secondly, not everything is structured in the EHR or in exactly the same representation. We will wind up with some ability. I think Cambia found that about 70% uh, of it could be done automatically. Um, if we get 70% on top of 50% uh, not requiring prior authorization at all, mm -hmm. that's a huge benefit on day one. And then I'm guessing it'll take us, you know, some time, a number of years to optimize that to get the extra 15 or 20 percent. Yeah, excellent. And speaking of optimizing, uh, uh, Richard asked the question, can the, the PAWS um, implementation guides handle both structured and unstructured attachments? Uh, yes, absolutely. Uh, it can handle any kind of attachment that is... Uh, uh, well, it, it'll handle any kind of attachment that you would like to put on it. What we focus on is any kind of attachment that comes out as a questionnaire. Now, a questionnaire can reference other types of documents. So the questionnaire, for example, can point to a PDF. The questionnaire can point to a, a, a CCDA. The questionnaire can point to an image. So the real vehicle we'd like to see used predominantly is the questionnaire pointing to other unstructured items. So we have the structured capability of the questionnaire and we have its unstructured capability to include other types of documentation. Very good. I appreciate this very much, Bob. Um, Janice did make a comment um, very uh, correctly that uh, the EHR uh, today is not required to do anything. However, because the final rule included um, uh, incentive program requirements, the expectation is that ONC is going to, to follow up pr probably within the next uh, few months uh, with a rule requiring uh, certified EHRs uh, to support the APIs. So I think that's on the horizon. Well, I think one thing we should be aware of when I'm talking about required within an implementation guide, that is, if you implement this process based on the implementation guide, you would not be compliant with the guide unless you met all of its requirements. That yep. doesn't mean you have to implement the implementation guide. Co correct. Yeah, as we saw from uh, from the CMS uh, presentation, uh, very good point. So with that, we are going to um, invite our panelists. If we were live, when they would come up to the podium. And uh, but we'll um, go through here. We um, we've heard from uh, Lorraine, Sh Shauna, and and Bob. So I'm going to uh, go go down the list and have our our panelists quickly introduce themselves and their organizations. And uh, we'll start with uh, Daniel Lloyd. Welcome. Yes, thank you. Um, thank you for having me. I'm Danielle Lloyd. I'm a senior VP for Private Market Innovations and quality initiatives at AHIP, which is the trade association representing health insurers nationwide. Wonderful. Dr. Rebecca and Angove. Oh, thanks for having me. I am Rebecca Angove, EVP of Research and Evaluation at Patient Advocate Foundation. We provide direct uh, services for patients with access and affordability challenges. Wonderful. And uh, Andrea Priestler, well, welcome. 
Hi, thank you so much for having me, Andrea Preisler. I am Senior Associate Director of Administrative Simplification Policy at the American Hospital Association. Excellent. And we heard from you, David, but if you can introduce yourself. Uh, yes. Good afternoon, everyone. David Delano, Executive Director of NEHIN, New England Healthcare Exchange Network, and part of the Mass Health Data Consortium. Wonderful. And uh, Diana Fuller? Excuse me. Diana Fuller, State of Michigan, Medicaid. Excellent. Thank you, Diana. Uh, John John Kelly. Hi, uh, Rob. Um, John Kelly, um, a board of the um, a board member of the Mass Health Data Consortium, uh, recently retired from uh, Weedy and EdFX. Excellent. And Heidi Chris. Hey, good afternoon. This is Heidi Kriz. I'm a director of medical policy and medical management at Regents, or, or as many people know on this call, Cambia. Um, I was the, the business lead that led our um, fire powered prior authorization that we launched in October of 2022. Excellent. Brian Poteet. Hi there. Yes, product manager uh, with NFX here working on prior authorizations. So deeply embedded in all these rules and happy to be here. Excellent. Heather uh, Kamas. Hey, everyone. I am Heather McComas. I'm Director of Administrative Simplification Initiatives at the American Medical Association, and I am also one of the co-chairs of the Weedy Prior Authorization Subwork Group. Excellent. Thank you. Uh, Mark Scrimshaw. Hi, Mark Scrimshaw, Chief Interoperability Officer at Onyx. So I'm not only an implementer, but I'm also working alongside Bob. Uh, on actually authoring the PDEX uh, Pay Data Exchange IG, which covers uh, the provider and payer to payer APIs and the patient access extension. Excellent. And uh, last, uh, Chuck Ver Verka. Hello, Chuck Verka. I'm a senior consultant with Kunstley and Associates in the healthcare arena. Uh, I've been working in support of State of Michigan Medicaid for the last 17 years and have prior uh, commercial insurance. Um, experience prior to that. Excellent. Well, you can tell we've got a, a fantastic panel here. And as we all know uh, too well, prior authorization has been a particularly challenging healthcare issue. With this final rule, CMS has laid the framework for a completely new approach for exchanging prior authorization data. These new uh, standards and workflow requirements hold tremendous opportunity, but carry with them some significant implementation concerns. So I thought maybe we would start our, our questions uh, directed towards uh, Lor Lorraine and, and Shanna. Uh, from the CMS perspective, uh, can you uh, place this regulation in the broader context of the administration's promotion of a more patient-centric healthcare system? Uh, yes, um, I think I can uh, try and tackle that one, uh, Shana. Um, as always, you all have very thought-provoking questions. And, um, you know, as I said earlier, we have been really pleased by the reaction to this rule, you know, as a, both in the presentations that we've been part of, where we've been able to speak, and the ones that we've heard from other organizations. And you are right that this administration's priority is focused on the person and person-centric care in all of the policies that have been coming out, being a lot really allowing patients to make informed decisions about their own treatment, having access to their information so that they can do that. Um, and one of the ways that this rule does that is that well, both rule what we call rule one, the interoperability and patient access final rule, and this rule for prior authorization is to help them have more ways of being informed about their information, to have a conversation with their provider, or to make sure that their payer has that information, and then to have all of that information be really in a 360 view. And so I think part of this way that this makes it more patient centric is to have all of that information available in all of the places where an individual might have touch points. And that's sort of focusing in on that patient centric perspective from the administration's viewpoint. I think the thing that um, we would say is that admittedly, 
as an industry, we still haven't cracked the nut of how we make sure that the patient gets engaged to so that we can make sure that it's patient centric. And that's something I think that we have the opportunity to work on together. And we so we do have these policies in the rule where the payers will be providing education both to providers um, <clears throat> uh, and to patients of, so here's this information that you have access to, here's how you can use it, but what is the information that you need in order to take better advantage of the data so that you can be better stewards of your own healthcare and of access to that healthcare. And I think that's where we'd really like to see some opportunities for being able to engage more. So that even though we've added those provisions, I think we still have a distance to go to really getting to that patient-centric perspective that we, you know, that is this administration's purview. Excellent. And, you know, we, we talk about prior authorization being this challenge in terms of da data flow between providers and health plans. But from the uh, patient's pr uh, perspective, Dr. Angove, why is automating uh, prior authorization so important? And how do you anticipate the care delivery process being impacted by these APIs? Yeah, thanks, Robert. It's a, it's a great question. And um, so at PAF, we work with patients um, every, day, every day, helping them access um, health care and, and navigate some of the, the challenges with access and affordability. Prior authorization, it's, it's a huge pain point for, for patient access. Um, you know, Lorraine alluded to it a bit. Anything that we can do to, to make um, the process more aligned with, with patients' needs and also make sure you're um, really focusing on that communication piece um, is, is really key, right? So reducing burden for patients, increasing efficiency, um, but it's not going to address all the issues, right? Automating some of these things aren't going to address every issue. And so um, the things that I, I really have pulled out of this is, is that communication piece, both education for um, providers and patients, but also um, how is that information going to be uh, communicated to patients in real time? Um, you know, what, what if there aren't enough details available? All of these things are, I think, are going to be worked out in the implementation, um, but this is a wonderful start really streamlining this to make sure patients are getting the um, the care they need in a timely manner um, with with all the information you know um, readily at their fingertips. So we're um, we're really excited about this rule. I appreciate that, and um, you know, uh, Danielle, you man mentioned that AHIP represents many of the health plans uh, in the nation. Um, what are you hearing uh, from your membership in terms of this regulation? Sure. Um, so I would, you know, just start at the highest level to start, um, you know, the plans have supported the CMS interoperability rules um, from the beginning. Um, it's really been around the, you know, sort of how and when <laughs> that uh, sort of the debate has been around. Um, we definitely appreciated uh, CMS providing a little bit additional uh, time to get this done in the final rule. So, you know, thanks to Lorraine and other friends at CMS there, um, because there are, you know, things that still need to be done in terms of uh, finalizing and testing the standards and, and building um, some of the infrastructure sort of broadly across all of the different um, uh, APIs and such. On, on electronic prior authorization specifically, um, you know, I, I, I think we have to start with saying that from a plan perspective, uh, it is an important tool, remains an important tool for plans to ensure the safety of their enrollees to make sure that providers are using evidence-based uh, guidelines um, and that the premiums remain uh, affordable. But we certainly recognize that the uh, process could use uh, some streamlining and improvements. Um, so we are very excited about um, electronic prior authorization. We think this can can help um, uh, pretty dramatically. Uh, but of course, we've got to get it in place to, to see exactly. I will note that the one part of the rule that the um, health insurance industry did not support was uh, shortening the timeframes for prior authorization for the standard requests um, before electronic prior authorization. We're a bit worried that trying to speed up the whole faxing process might uh, result in unintended consequences. We're gonna have to sort of see how that see how that goes. But um, 
to focus on some of the things we're watching from an implementation perspective and infrastructure perspective. Um, the first is the, um, the uh, attachment standard rule. Um, we really uh, hope <laughs> that CMS will put out a rule that is silent on prior auth uh, because we really want to see the ability to do this, um, you know, to do fire end to end. We appreciate that CMS has said there's going to be some enforcement discretion of the 278, but we still have to uh, reconcile the, what's going to happen with the 275. And as um, uh, Bob pointed out, we need to actually see the paperwork on this, right? The the documentation. Um, you know, it's been uh, mentioned as well. Um, by Rob and some others, you know, we are awaiting uh, the HTI2 rule from ONC. We are really concerned that we need to make sure that the electronic health record vendors are required to build the EPA uh, capability into the provider's workflow. Um, and, you know, it needs to be on roughly the same timeline. We're a little bit worried about a disconnect um, on sort of because that rule is so much further behind whether or not we're gonna be able to sync up so that sort of both ends are ready um, at the same time. And, you know, from the plan perspective, we had hoped that there would be a little bit of a uh, more significant incentive, maybe uh, is a way to put it, for the providers to use EPA uh, than a quality measure. I don't, I don't think um, uh, Andrea and Heather are probably going to like me saying that, but um, we're a little concerned uh, that that's not uh, sort of a significant enough incentive. Um, one of the other big areas that we're looking at is the national healthcare directory, um, because we don't have you know the digital endpoints across everyone as of yet. We've been supporting CMS's RFI notion and asking Congress to actually fund them. Uh, for this, but that's sort of a big linchpin um, of having that information together. Um, and I'll just cover two other things. Uh, one is we're hearing from members around the reason for denial code. CMS has been pretty open in the rule, you know, of enough information to, uh, you know, for a provider to act. Um, but we've heard from members that they use sort of a combination of X12 and CMS codes, proprietary codes. So getting that sort of lined up. And then lastly, the um, you know standards and IGs, right? Very far along, but um, we wanna see testing at scale. And there are some areas where we're hearing from members, there's still some gaps. Um, so for example, with uh, DTR, uh, interaction with plans that have delegated models to um, providers or others and how that's uh, that's going to work. So uh, no shortage of things to uh, work on in the next uh, couple of years from our perspective, but we're super excited that, that this is moving forward. Excellent. I appreciate that. And, and David, I know you uh, you had a comment. I did. I just wanted to expand on a question I posed in the chat earlier. I think Lorraine answered it. It was about the uh, uh, the exception and whether that. Well, no. Well, she answered that one. Let's let's shift over. The, the question I have for Danielle is about uh, the the commercial plans versus the specifically named plans. Do you have any thoughts about that? Um, sure. Um, you know, obviously, from an antitrust perspective, each plan has to make a decision on their own as to whether or not um, if they are not a plan in a federal program where they're required to do this, whether or not they want to voluntarily do to do this. Um, I think part of the reasons I started with um, the attachment standard and the enforcement discretion is that I think will make a big difference for the commercial plans in terms of them potentially um, adopting this, um, but it's a little bit uh, too soon. You know, there haven't been any public announcements, um, but certainly to the extent that uh, plans have uh, business that's plans and federal programs plus commercial, you know, the technology will already be built. It'll be a bit easier for them um, to implement, but we, we don't have um, any uh, public responses as of yet from individual plans. I appreciate that. And I did want to give Lorraine the opportunity if, if she wanted to put in the chat the exact date that the attachments rule is coming out, we we would certainly appreciate it. But in lieu of that, um, let, let, let me turn over to, 
to Andrea, if if you want to comment, obviously a hugely important rule for hospitals. I don't know if you, it, you know, it's fairly early, but I don't know if you've got a sense yet of, of where the inpatient fa facility perspective is. Sure. Um, overall, hospitals thus far are, have been absolutely thrilled with the rule. Um, we're really excited about it. We think it can go very far and hopefully reducing some of that provider burden. And, you know, of course, most importantly, getting patients timely care um, and, and helping with some access issues. Um, we really think that it should alleviate some of those sticking points in the process, like figuring out what clinical documentation is necessary for a given prior authorization, um, even taking a step back from there, whether prior authorization is required for a particular item or service. Um, we think it'll really cut down on, you know, payer time on those proprietary portals, those faxes back and forth, phone calls. Um, so overall, we're we're really excited about. I know what what um, Bob termed the common workflow expectations. I think that will really go a long way for providers. Um, additionally, kind of talking on the MA side, we are thrilled to see that MA plans are subject to the rule. Um, as we were kind of just alluding to, we really hope that that will help incentivize commercial plans overall to expand um, this rule or this technology to other lines of business. We also think it'll go a long way in helping bring providers to the table um, so that they can realize some of those savings and those efficiencies for their MA patients. Um, so in terms of incentivizing providers to come to the table, we think that MA plans being included here will go a long way. Um, we do have some of those remaining concerns. We too are concerned with the testing. You know, We are thrilled with the technology where it stands today. But of course, we really want to see some of that real world testing, more robust testing um, across the spectrum of stakeholders. Um, I will also note, I think a, a question on everyone's mind, as we've said, is that 278 enforcement discretion. We were very happy to see that enforcement discretion, but are you know very curious to see what the guidance is, um, wanting to make sure that we're not expected to support both FIRE and the 278 um, and kind of, yeah, just excited to see the guidance there. Um, also, I know we, we disagree with Daniel here on some of those timing provisions. We were very, very happy with the timing provisions, but we think that, you know, especially as the technology matures and can really get us closer to those real time answers back and forth, we're really hoping to kind of push those timeframes even further. Um, and I think the, the last thing on providers or on the hospital's mind is um, the drugs covered under the patient's medical benefit and bringing those into the world of electronic prior authorization. Um, so I know CMS mentioned that that's, you know, possibly in future rulemaking. So we're, we're looking forward to that. Excellent. And uh, uh, it was mentioned in the chat that unfortunately, I think the state of Ohio requires use of the two 78. So um, that guidance will be interesting in light of some state action as well. Yeah, and um, to the extent that people want to send us which states require that, um, we're happy to lobby on behalf of everyone yeah. to remove those. So <laughs> send them along. Exactly. It's a, certainly an area of consensus in the industry, for sure. Um, let me uh, turn to Heather uh, to give the in the sort of the, uh, the outpatient per perspective on this. Obviously, prior authorization has been a critical issue for you for several years. Um, how does the final rule address your concerns? And do you see this as the end point or the sort of the beginning of a yet a longer journey? Thanks, Rob. And uh, first of all, our, our kind of start off by echoing what Andrea just said, we um, at the AMA are immensely appreciative of CMS taking this action. It's um, it's so important. Um, it's it's really a step in the right direction. And I, you know, the administration's gone about this in a, a careful way. You know, starting off initially by having these roundtables with different stakeholder groups, getting all this input, and um, going through several kind of iterations of rulemaking to try to get things as right as possible. And we really appreciate all this work. This is definitely a move in the right direction for, for our physician members, but more than that, all of us as patients who need medical care at, at some point in our lives. So it definitely is, it's a, a good move towards the future, but 
Um, I, I think uh, all of us can rest assured there is job security here <laughs> for all of us. There is still work left to do. Um, the rule does address um, many important aspects of this issue, but there are gaps, um, some of which we've already started talking about. Um, Andrea hit on this and it's also been raised in the chat a couple times, the whole issue of drugs, right? Drugs of every color were explicitly excluded from the scope of this rule. And um, this is very concerning. Um, you know, there are, we certainly already heard from our physicians loud and clear on this. And I think uh, Dr. Ango mentioned this, you know, for a lot of patients, depending on your disease state, it's the medications is a huge part of your treatment. And so you're kind of being left out of this help. Um, it is true that there are several, several um, existing regulations that address some of these same topics, such as processing timelines for Part D outpatient prescription drugs. And there's also already um, an electronic standard for prescription drugs through the NCPDP e-prescribing um, EPA standards. So some of these um, topics that were addressed in this rule have been addressed in other regulations already, but um, the administration has already clearly signaled, I, I think from previous presentations, I think even the, the first week the, the rule came out that um, drugs covered on the medical benefit um, are a, a sizable gap in this rule, right? There's not a, um, electronic technology right now designated for that use. And, um, you know, I've heard Bob say multiple times, and Bob, please uh, step in, and if I'm not correct here, that the the um, the guides, the FHIR API guides, do uh, uh, support exchange of data regarding medications covered under a medical benefit and infuse in physician's office, but they're out of scope for this rule. But I think there's a big question mark. We know those drugs tend to be quite expensive, right? We're talking about chemotherapy drugs, specialty drugs, biologics. They almost always require prior authorization. And so we're kind of leaving this huge chunk out there. And I, I know that I heard folks from CMS already indicate that they're aware of that. It's not like lost upon them and that it's something they're looking forward to addressing moving forward. So that's something um, I think that's really important and, and out there for us on our, our to-do list. I also think that um, this has come up um, a couple times already, but you know these. I mean, CMS look and as Andrea indicated, we're very excited that the final rule included Medicare Advantage plans. And the first iteration that came of this rulemaking that came out in late 2020, ME plans were not included. So we see this as being far more impactful. Um, and CMS, you know, basically addressed you know, all the the types of plans within their scope. Um, and regulatory scope, but there are tons of plans that are left outside, right? You know, commercial payers, ERISA plans. And, you know, we hear a lot of our members saying, you know, this is only one set of health plans that I do business with. What about all of these other plans? And so, um, you know, these questions of, well, folks, um, the plans start implementing these technologies and also these operational requirements, such as the processing timelines and the public reporting for their other lines of business. I think that's kind of a TBD. And obviously our members would like all, you know, every plan, regardless of um, how they're regulated to be um, held to these requirements. Um, and then it is uh, Andrea briefly touched on already. I think we might get it to a, maybe dig into this a little bit more in a couple of minutes. Um, we do um, have concerns about the timing uh, requirements of the rule. Uh, we think that, frankly, they're they're way too generous, particularly when the electronic prior auth technology goes into effect in 2027. I think that um, any of us who have ever had an urgent medical condition would not want to wait 72 hours for, for a decision on whether or not we could get our care covered. So we really think that urgent processing timeline should come down and, and very well can come down once the technology is in place. And it's also true for standard prior authorizations. We think that seven day processing is, is still too long. Again, we're talking about people's health and, and their well being. Um, and I think there's other issues that um, you know could be addressed as well um, moving forward. Things like um, goal carding programs that exclude physicians with strong prescribing and ordering records and following evidence-based uh, medicine guidelines from prior auth requirements to begin with. Um, things like using the data that is now going to be required to be publicly reported for further reform efforts. We we look at the data um, and see you know high level of denials and you know start drilling down to certain kinds of services. Are they being denied more frequently? Are there other regulatory um, levers that should be pulled to ensure that patients are getting the, the care that they need? And then um, the final thing, I kind of uh, address Danielle's point about the the kind of provider skin on the game piece with the MIPS program, electronic prior auth requirement. I mean, we were very happy to see that, um, as Shanna indicated, 
um, earlier in the initial CMS presentation part of this that um, the MIPS requirement and the final rule change from a um, numerator denominator model to more of a just a strict adaptation, adaptation, which we think is far more appropriate and will not be nearly as cumbersome on our, our members. But we will um, we would argue strongly that if this technology really is all that we hope it is and all of us are striving for it to be, physicians will flock to use it, right? We, we hear all the time about how burdensome this is and all the time people spend standing by the fax machine for heaven's sakes, making sure this paper has gone through the plant. It's ridiculous. And so if this technology works the way that Bob has described it and, and these um, prior author requests are being auto-populated, physicians will wanna use it. They won't need to be beat over the head or have you know owner's requirements on this. Is this really works the way that it should and we all do an A plus job of implementing it. I will um, swear um, upon my dear late mother's grave that physicians will want to use this technology, both for reducing burns, but also to ensure that their patients get the care that they need in a timely fashion. Uh, excellent. Um, and that's a great segue um, because a lot of the benefits that um, are associated with the APIs um, stem from the implementation guide. So my question to, to Mark and Bob, our resident experts uh, on the IGs, uh, CMS has recommended, but not required the use uh, or the adherence to the implementation guides. Uh, how will uh, that decision by the agency impact adoption and ultimately effective use of the APIs? Uh, Mark first. Yep. Okay. Um, what I would say is I think it's actually the right decision at the right time. We know that these guides are going to need to mature with feedback from the uh, from the, the community, and we saw that with things like the original formulary IG that we went through a major reconstruction as a result of direct feedback from the people implementing it. At some point, these guides will become required, but I think we want to see them mature. And I would say to anybody out there looking to implement is read the tea leaves and the tea leaves are saying, you should use these guides. Bob, over to you. I think there are two things that we need to consider. One is um, CMS has already given every possible indication that future regulation will not just um, point to these guys as recommended, but require them. So it makes little since to try to avoid implementing them, knowing what's coming down the pike. I'm a little more comfortable that the guides that we have right now are, um, I'll call it 95% guides, meaning they cover the vast majority. I'm not saying there won't be any changes, but the number of changes is gonna be relatively small given the feedback we've had. The second thing is, I think the HTI2 rule will have a significant impact because if we wind up with a requirement for certification to support these guides, then we now have a reason for the EHRs to go and implement them or the, um, and maybe they'll have the technology requirement on both sides, not just EHRs, but payers, uh, so that we have a incentive, an incredibly strong incentive for EHRs and payers to do the implementation based on ONC requirements. I don't think there's a guarantee that we'll have to do it right now, but boy, as Mark said, all the tea leaves are uh, reading the same, that within the next several years, there will be an absolute requirement to do it. Excellent. One thing I would add to, to that, Bob, is I know in the, in the, amongst the standards writers, we've been discussing around the fact that CMS currently requires US Core 311 and ONC and HTI1 has gone for US Core 6.1. And I think some, it, there's, there's suggestions in the rule that indicate that things are going to change there, but the sooner that CMS can put out that guidance, the better, because I don't think the industry wants to go through implementing using US Core 311 and partway through then have to switch to US Core 6 because 311 is now obsolete. And Mark, let me, let me just say, I don't think the it's a, so much a barrier. Uh, no. The vast majority of 6.1 uh, 
is backward compatible with 3.1.1, the vast majority of them. There are small changes, that's true, but implementing mm -hmm. on 3.1.1 1 doesn't create something that is throwaway. It creates something that may have to be updated or upgraded. So I'm not real concerned about it. Yes, we want to be on a common set of standards based on ONC's requirements, but I don't see any problem in implementing what's there and then doing the small amount of change is necessary to support 6.1. And this is Shanna Hartman at CMS. I just want to note that um, implementers can voluntarily advance um, to US Core 611. There is no restrictions in preventing them from doing so. So we do recommend um, if you want to do that, go for it. Um, and there is nothing that's stopping you. But as you said, yes, CMS does plan to address this in future rulemaking. And I'll just say, uh, Bob did make a comment in the chat uh, regarding uh, drugs and that uh, they are included in the implementation guide. They're not required uh, under the rule, but there's no prohibition against a health plan supporting them. So I think good point. Um, David, I see your hand. Yeah. Could I just well, clarify two things, uh, Bob? Uh, one is um, I thought that drugs included in medical treatment because if it's a part of a medical treatment that includes other procedures or other activities, then my impression was those were included in the rule. Is that not the case? Is anybody well, the language, the language that came out in the final rule was any drugs covered by the plan, not part D, which would work better for what you've got. So the way they did it was they said any drugs covered by the plan, which implies it's everything, including those that are part of medical benefits. So we'll be submitting a, a, a clarification question to CMS and they can respond back. Um, but at the moment, I would suggest that the interpretation is they have excluded all drugs as a requirement. Okay. Interesting. Yeah. And um, Denny mentions that uh, Dan Danny Brennan from MHDC mentioned uh, drugs covered under the pharmaceutical benefit use the NCPDP script standard for e-prescribing, but e EPA for these drugs uh, remained orphaned from the fire a a APIs and IGs. I guess the question is, um, what will be needed to uh, bring them into EPA? I don't know if anybody has a, a, a comment on that. Well, rulemaking for one. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> right. That's sort of a big that's sort of a big one. We we need another Bob Deedley to go through the NCPDP standard and tease it apart <laughs> and build in prior off. Can we clone Bob? <laughs> well, would it Take really a require... of confidence, but uh, let's let's hope that doesn't have to happen. <laughs> the question is whether uh, though maybe whether we simply need to find a way to interface from NCPDP into, for example, the patient access API, because that API is then really the basis for both the provider access and the payer to payer. So if we can find a way to get that information from the MCPDP world into the patient access uh, API, that would be potentially a step forward. Excellent. Uh, John, yep. I, yeah, I think uh, in my view, it's, it's a clarification of wording of what does it mean by covered by the plan? It, because when plans cover drugs under the medical benefit, they actually convert into CPT and other codes that can be processed in the, the medical claim system. So I would suggest that it, C, CMS could just clarify the definition of covered by the plan, and then that would draw a pretty hard line between is it paid for in the PBM system or is it paid for in the 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 medical system because you know Bob's right you mentioned Part D or medical drugs those aren't clear black and white lines but there's a clear line in the plan's mind about where they're processing the claim under the medical benefit and where they're processing the claim under the pharma benefit and so I would suggest Lorraine you know that's a comment you might bring back and just say it may be as simple as clarifying that language. I don't think it's as simple as clarifying that language from the health plan 
industry perspective, I think that's pretty squarely in rulemaking because that was that's not a logical outgrowth from the way CMS has positioned it in this current role. I would agree in the current language, that's true. Yeah, great discussion. Um, I wanted to bring in uh, Brian to talk a little of, more broadly about, um, you know, we've got two sets of health plans. We've got those that are required to to uh, to to follow the mandate, and then we've got these other plans that are encouraged but not required. Uh, Brian, what are some of the major uh, challenges that health plans in general are going to face trying to implement this rule? Yeah, great question. And and yeah, I think that's <laughs> looking at my notes here as we're talking, the first bullet I have is really understanding from a plan perspective, what your processes and actual stakeholders that tie to this rule are. You know, one of the things I, you know, I'm a nerd that I love about all of this rulemaking and how it's structured this time around as compared to previous rules that were kind of more technical in nature is it, it puts that patient focus in there and, and really focuses on describing and understanding the processes as well as the technology. And, but what that means is that to meet these rules that become effective one one twenty six and then stagger into one one twenty seven, and you could even argue some in twenty five, depending upon how you read the reporting rules. It all really necessitates understanding how you're doing this business, and especially for plans that may participate across these barriers of compliance. You know, if you're utilizing the same resources, maybe it's time to look at saying, okay, can I actually modernize and get together a strategy that can take the whole business forward. And now there's a business reason to make this decision to bring in these other plans. So I think that's really first is key is really understanding how those things tie together um, because it, it's not just a technical rulemaking effort uh, this time around in our view. It is, it is deeply integrated into how the plans and the patients interact with the plans and the providers interact with the plans as well. Um, you know, in addition to that, I'd say if you're on the plan side, understand how complex this data is, right? We, in some of our pilot efforts that we've been talking to different plans about, you know, there's this kind of mixing of metaphors, if you will, between benefits administration and kind of knowing whether things do require prior auth. It's a simple question, but has a very complicated answer in many cases, um, you know, all the way up to receiving and processing of a prior authorization. That may be blending different systems and different ways that data is structured between those systems, which means now those systems either have to conceptually agree in some manner and or if you're managing those interfaces separately to ensure the experience is consistent, they need to be coming to the same decision about whether a service requires prior authorization at the point of CRD or at the point of submission. The last thing you want is CRD to say, yes, prior auth is required, and then your prior auth submission gets returned saying no prior auth is required, right? So you want to be sure that everything is in agreement end to end from a data management perspective. And that kind of goes alongside with the overall architectural impacts of how you're already administering some of these APIs. You know, if you're looking at your current 9115 infrastructure for patient access API, and now you're layering on provider access and adding on the requirements for payer to payer to carry all this authorization data, right? You wanna be looking and saying, okay, how can I leverage the investments that I've got and or if those investments aren't working for me, what can I do to make this actually be useful, right? Because the whole point is to make it useful for the patients. Um, so, you know, really taking that mindset of, and making it persona based and rather than just ticking off boxes in the compliance world, that's kind of what I would say is really the most important thing in driving that type of strategy into all your conversations, right? Put the people first um, and, and, you know, connect your technical and business teams right now, right? If you start looking at how these, these uh, rules stagger out and the business processes that exist to collect data and report it out today, even if it's only to internal stakeholders, now you've got to publish that data, which means a new process to publish. Same thing for medical policy. You have a publishing process for that, but now you need to digitize them and make them available via APIs. So understanding all of those things and getting these teams talking that may have never even talked before in this particular context 
you know, is is definitely key to getting this whole uh, engine started and running. No, excellent. And um, let me turn to John because uh, you know there's two ways to look at this rule. Uh, it is a compliance exercise, the check the box, or it's an enormous opportunity to completely change the way that uh, providers and payers exchange data. Um, if it's the latter, uh, in in particular, uh, what do in, I'll maybe focus on providers? How will they need to change their workflow to make uh, all of this happen and really to take uh, advantage? Of, as Heather alluded to, take advantage of this rule and and really uh, drive out some of the burden. That's a great question, uh, Rob. And it's I think it gets to the heart of, is this going to be successful going forward or is it just going to create a lot of expense with not a lot of value? Um, let, me, let me start with it on the payer side. Bob had mentioned Cambia earlier, uh, achieving a, a good deal of automation, auto population of the questionnaire, because this rule is really designed to get at the 16 hours a week for every provider in every office around the country of eating up their time. Prior auth has largely, under the X12 model, automated things on the payer side. So how are you going to automate the provider side? Well, the, the payers, what can be found when it tried to automate its medical policy rules and it worked very closely with MCG, was a lot of the rules weren't automatable. So they had to adjust the way they, they defined their rules to create structured data. And that's what allowed the auto population. If the structured data is available on the fire server, then you can automate the pre-population. Now, that means that as more and more of the medical decisions and decision support uh, software comes into play, providers are going to have to look at the way they engage with the patient and capture structured data in their system. Right now, a lot of the PA vendors are talking, you know, uh, making great claims about AI and NLP, how they can claw all this unstructured data out of the medical record and then use that to pre-populate. That's a lot of money and a lot of work. If in the course of capturing, if, if pro providers knew what the payer was going to want ahead of time, and if that was built into the workflows and the EMRs, then the normal course of delivery providers would be prompted to capture information in a structured way to pre-populate the fire server. And that way, when the PA rules come in, it's just go, oh, I don't even need to engage with the provider. Let me just pull the data on the patient out of the fire server. I've been given permission by the order. So boom, it's done. And that means though, to some degree, providers are going to have to look at their workflow as they see the patient. Everybody who's seeing the patient is going to have to think about and work with Epic Concern and those guys to capture information in a little bit different way rather than the way they've been doing. If they really want to carve, you know, that 50 or 60 or a hundred billion dollars out of their operating costs by automating the pre-population, they're going to have to also think about how they pre-populate data in the fire server. And that gets to that question about 3.0 versus 6.0. The, the, the language, the data model of fire is going to continue to expand. What can be in the fire server is always going to be greater and greater. So over time, the payers and the providers are going to have a, be able to have a much more granular conversation about appropriate use and appropriate care just based on the structured information they captured in the fire server as they go from three to four to five to six to eight to 20. Excellent. I, I think, uh, Bob, I see your hand up. Yeah, I just want to emphasize a point that John made. Uh, it's not just what providers capture and how they capture it. It's how payers write their requirements. When mm -hmm. they turn around and say evidence of that's not computable. When they turn around and say, we need a specific diagnosis from this list, that's entirely computable. So yeah. they just have to think in terms of structured information as much as providers and EHRs have to think in terms of structured information. That's why I'm saying there's a certain set of this we can automate Right now, there's another set of it that'll take years of adjustment on both sides. And Bob, that's what, when you talk about Canby, I know when I talked to the people at MCG and Canby, Canby kept saying, automate this rule, automate this rule. MCG kept coming back and going, well, you know, that's hard to automate. And eventually, 
Gambia said, well, what rules do you have that are automatable? We'll just use yours. I think people, even the payer conversations I've heard with the vendors have been, can you automate my rules? And what we're going to find as an industry is that just paving over the cow paths is not going to get to where we want to get to. <laughs> That we want to change the way, change the questions that payers are asking and change the way that providers can easily answer those questions with a machine rather than sitting down at a keyboard and typing into a smart on fire form. Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, we'll go Danielle and then Mark. Just to, um, I just want to add something uh, that Brian and John were uh, related to what they were saying that, you know, whether or not commercial are able to do this, um, you know, it, it does depend on the sort of the plan and how they're structured and such. And just as an example, if, uh, you know, a plan has different lines of businesses that were purchased through acquisitions, you know, the systems can be, um, uh, you know, separate, right, and siloed, uh, you know, so there can be some, you know, unique issues. And there's also, you know, the PA rules are not exactly the same across populations. You have different rules for children than you do for the elderly and um, in between, right? Um, and so across the, those lines of businesses, there might be a little bit different. So um, that's not to say that they can't do it by any means. And I think that that a lot of plants will want to over time, but it could mean that um, that the timing of it, it takes longer than the plans and in, in federal programs. Uh, and Mark? Yeah, uh, just really to build on what uh... Uh, John and, and Bob were saying, the, the big advantage we have here is US Core has now really created a baseline for the structured information that you can query from. So it's, it's understanding the searches that you can make into that data in order to be able to retrieve stuff. So plans have really got to think about what data do I really want? And is that actually searchable using basically US Core uh, search against given resources to get the evidence that they actually want. But that will, I think, lead to, as, as Bob indicated earlier, a standardization around certain types of queries that you're going to make. You know, the query of, you know, is this a female aged between this this and this date, uh, this age? Or, you know, has someone got evidence of a certain A1C reading within the last six months? All these will become, I think, regularly almost standardized queries that will be possible to generate that evidence. We'll go, uh, John, quickly, and then we want to hear directly from the plan that is actually doing this. Uh, John first. Yeah. Oh, I think you're on mute. Yeah, I'll say quickly, the flip side of all that conversation about automating all the work on the provider is the loophole of not doing the 278. The 278, there's at least, well, according to CAQH, 100 to 200 million uh, electronic transactions, largely based on the X12 data model. That's designed to automate the payment. So we want to be careful if we totally eliminate the 278 and all the metadata in it, that we could automate the provider side and then completely screw up the automation of the payment on the payer side. So, you know, we'll see how that plays out. But machines were available 10 years ago at every every clearinghouse and a lot of vendors to make this whole question of X12, 278 mapping is automated. It's a red herring as far as I'm concerned in that, you know, the, both, both data sets have a purpose to automate the two sides of the house. Appreciate that. And, uh, and, and I'm going to turn it over to Heidi, for, but just to say that she's also uh, agreed to speak on our next one. Uh, so we'll hear more, but uh, give us a sense, Heidi, of, of, of the challenges that, that you faced and how you overcame them. Yeah, I was going to comment just on the, the kind of the health plan requirements, the clinical data points really quickly. There's been a lot of conversation today. I think I could comment on every single one of them. I'm trying to hold back a little bit. Um, but in general, what we're seeing is about 40% of the time we can get the clinical data points that we, we know we can get to. Those are things like a diagnosis that really should exist in the EMR and we know where it should exist. Um, so I think what that's telling us, right, is the providers don't have that clinical data point where, where it, it, we think it should be. Um, and so I agree with the point that John was making. I think, you know, I just finished our first full evaluation. I'm gonna present that at HIMSS, but, um, Really what we need to do now is, is I'm gonna go back to MultiCare, who's our provider right now in production with this workflow and say, 
hey, there's a simple diagnosis here that would help us automate this even more. It, you know, does it exist? Why isn't it here? Or where are you putting it in the EMR? And I think there's a lot of conversations between the health plan and the provider that are going to have to happen to really make this successful. And we're just starting on the brink of that. Um, I think as a health plan, there's always going to be probably in the prior authorization space, a non-discrete data element to it. It is incredibly difficult for a lot of the prior auths that we do, especially in the surgery space, not to have a non-discrete clinical data requirement, especially um, around conservative therapies before an invasive back surgery, uh, family history for a genetic testing request. And so for me, it's a combination. What can I get discreetly and quickly and easily? And then secondarily, how do I supplement that? And that's what my goal is for 2024, which is to really answer those questions so that we can automate as much as possible. Um, I've, I, I do think there's, there's room for um, also automating many of the discrete data elements and then using a human maybe to look at one thing in that prior auth, which is still gonna turn it around a lot faster than current state. So a lot more to come in that space. Appreciate that. Um, we are going to uh, next, uh, uh... Turn, uh, turn it over to Diana and Chuck from the state of, Me of Michigan Medicaid. Um, you've heard a lot from uh, different folks. Uh, what do you see as the major hurdles uh, that you'll face trying to, to meet the requirements by January 1, 2027? Well, one of the things, this is Chuck. Um, one of the things that we've been considering since reviewing the proposed rule and now seeing in the final rule is the potential for only using the API PA submission as the entry mechanism for the request. And uh, obviously we have quarterly software updates to our adjudication system in Michigan. And there is a significant cost associated to maintaining such a system by any payer. And if we are able to um, obtain the data that's necessary for a review by whatever in, input mechanism, we can perform the function, right? So if we get it through an API or we get it through a 278, you know, it, it's just a matter of what is the exchange mechanism that we have to use in order to exchange with our partners. And if the industry is moving towards Firebase, where if the industry is moving towards API exchange as the primary or preferred mechanism, then it would give us the uh, opportunity to focus our resources in that arena instead of continuing to support, for example, uh, a 278 transaction. Now, we are interested also in the correlation between the current final rule on PAs and the attachment rule. And uh, various other folks on the panel have dis uh, discussed that and, and uh, pointed out some pertinent issues there. And I appreciate that and respect the entire group on your panel, Rob. Uh, the uh, interesting thing, though, is that even though we started kicking around the idea of can we just use an API feed mechanism for the re PA request, is how do we, uh, you know, throw the bathwater out without throwing the baby. So for example, uh, within uh, one of the three points that Lorraine addressed, the reasons for denial, one of the, <clears throat> excuse me, one of the requirements in Michigan is that when a final decision is reached, we have to publish that decision in a letter to the provider and to the beneficiary and within that letter, describe what the decision is that has been reached and why. But our unit also goes a little bit beyond that and will try to interpret the need of the beneficiary and suggest, if, in the case of a denial, and suggest if there's an alternative um, a DME item or something of that sort that might fulfill the need of the patient even if the item that was requested might have been denied or not covered. And we are thinking about how do we port that kind of information over into, uh, for example, an API exchange and, and continue to maintain the benefit, not only of fulfilling the requirement of having to advise on what the final decision is, but also to 
immediately be able to supply additional information to the provider so that they can consider an alternative treatment mechanism, device, et cetera, et cetera. And because our current regulation in Michigan states that we're sending that in the form of a letter, yes, we have some you know prepackaged letters that are used, but that are editable to include that additional information. And so it's easy to provide that advi advisory information today in the form of the letter. And we are going to be seeking how can we continue to do that using any one of the the um, the new APIs specifically with the the PA request. Also, getting back to Lorraine's comments, I think one of the hurdle for uh, hurdles for Michigan is going to be complying with the decision time frame. <clears throat> now, I'll preface that with the comment that Michigan has been very proactive in the past in terms of reducing PA requirements. You know, if there was an automatic yes response. Uh, on a PA requirement, the PA requirement was removed. If we uh, typically saw that uh, people were, were going through uh, perhaps 16 rehab visits and they needed actually 24, we increased the number before you would need to require uh, to request a PA uh, review. And we would recommend any payer try to reduce your overall PA requirements list as much as you can and believe that that goes hand in hand with going forward into a new technology because you'll just have fewer items that are going to require uh, a PA response of, yes, we need this documentation or or this a lab test or whatever. So, <clears throat> excuse me. <clears throat> so that means that that's prefatory remark. What we're going to be faced with is moving from a decision time frame. Uh, right now, Michigan's mandate is 15 working days to a seven calendar day response for a final decision. And obviously that impacts workflow. When, in, uh, when a payer organization has already done what they can to reduce the volume of PA requirements and to thereby reduce the work and the resources needed, then when you have to further reduce the time frame in which those final decisions can be made on the remaining required services, then that's a challenge. Now we're talking about people and we're talking about people with a specific knowledge set who are able not only to do the assessments, but also to deal with our provider community appropriately to convey what those requirements uh, are and why those decisions are reached in the manner they are. Excellent. No, Chuck, I, I appreciate that. Uh, and um, Rebecca, do you want to make a comment? This one, thought I saw a hand up. No, if nope. if I did, that was inadvertent. I was um, okay. commenting in the chat. Sorry, Robert. No worries. Um, we've only got uh, just a few minutes left, and I wanted to um start with uh, Dave, David, and then go to Heidi with a a simple question. Um, Bob, uh, in his slide deck, I saw one that had testing, testing, testing. How important is it? Um, because you, you, both you and um, your colleague he Heidi have already implemented, you've already had a, a, a sense of how this is going. And then if, if, if anybody else wanted to make a quick comment, how important is testing here? Uh, yeah, ladies before gentlemen, Heidi, you want to go? <laughs> sure. <laughs> Uh, obviously, it's incredibly important. I mean, for us, too, we're really blazing the trail, just not only with the firework we did, but just EPA in general. Um, we've been doing it since 2017, so lots of lessons learned along the way. Um, I think as you're innovating, there's always something that's going to come up many times that you're not expecting, which did happen to us, um, not only internally, but just in, in the first connection we made with MultiCare. I did want to reiterate to uh, somebody who said something about just even doing an adequate CRD check. I, I just really wanted to emphasize that piece too, because that was a big one for us. You have to be able to do a PA check well as a health plan to really make this work and make it better for everybody, including the providers, but most importantly, the patients at the end of the day and our members on the health plan. 
Um, that one required a lot of work, a lot of testing, a lot of just going back to the drawing board. The benefit track is incredibly complicated. Uh, we still are working on it today. Um, even though we launched it in 2017, we are still making enhancements, changes, making it better because that is really the I think the most important part of this whole entire process, most of this, the, the auths don't require PA. And then when they do, that's what drives our entire workflow. So we have to get it right to really achieve that automation um, we're talking about. But yeah, we have a whole team dedicated to uh, testing this. I could go on and on. And I actually had a conversation this morning about our team and how we could make it better and, and, and really beef it up even more so. Because the other thing at the end of the day is, is when we release something, this is a big change management for the providers. I know there was comments earlier about the providers coming to the table. Well, we've been live since October of 2022. And I can tell you, I have one provider in production. I've got eight in the wings right now and one going under technical integration. But until we can get this into more of a large scale um, national um, uh, structure or workflow with the providers not having to connect to different health plans, um, it is incredibly difficult to get the providers to the table, I have to be honest. Um, and so I think we need to strive uh, toward that as well. Excellent. And that's a great preview for our session coming up on March 4th. David, yep. you've got 30 seconds yeah. uh, to yeah. sum everything up. Yeah, no, very quick. Rob, I think everybody's already said everything, but um, uh, we did a prototype project. So essentially, it was a t the whole thing was a test. <laughs> you know, it, it involved production and live use of CRD, but I wanted to echo Heidi's comments and Bob Beagley's earlier. And I think someone else mentioned that getting CRD right on the front end is certainly a, a, a high priority for us going forward. I, I hope for everyone else because, you know, getting that right, getting the benefit checks right, the accumulators, all the various, you know, master nations, including provider locations specifically uh, correct at the time of of eligibility of verification and, and check is essential to uh, filtering out all the unneeded and unnecessary work. So I'm right with you on all that. Fantastic. Well, really outstanding panel and tremendous uh, discussion, but it's not going to end there. We're going to turn it over to, uh, to Brian uh, to uh, talk a little bit more about prior authorization and uh, the perspective from MedFX. Brian, floor is yours. Thank you. I like that you uh, snagged my uh, my other life bio as a trombone player. Uh, <laughs> get my artistic side out there. Appreciate that. Let me share my screen. All right. Theoretically, you should be seeing my first slide. Perfect. Right. We yeah. are. Looks good. All right. Perfect. So. Um, Really, obviously, in the theme of payer, provider, and patient impact, right? We want to look a little bit at trying to help all parties involved as much as we can. Really figure out how to do this and how can you strategically implement? How do you gain value, right? I think Mark made a great comment that this is going to start as a compliance initiative because those are generally the technical folks who are closest to those regulations and have the responsibility but it will inevitably turn into a business transformation initiative at some point because of the, the far reaching implications of the rule, both from a technical and business process standpoint, right? So, but the key thing in gaining value out of those is understanding where you have value to gain, right? Um, so how do you build that consensus to actually implement, you know, what are the actual benefits, right? So. Um, now, first off, of course, they say, you know, presentation one on one, start with a joke. So I'm going to start with a little funny cartoon here. I'll give everybody a chance to read this. The geeks among us have probably seen this. But the reason I bring it up is not to say that that's the situation we're in. It's more to say that this is the situation we do not want to be in. We don't want to just treat this as another regulation just because we recognized that there was a problem, right? I think everybody has recognized that PA has been a burr in the in the shoe or, you know, thorn in the side, whatever um, uh, colloquialism you'd like to, to say is out there. But, you know, now that we have a standard, right, we don't want to just be looking at it from a stand in terms of, oh, geez, how do I implement these four new requirements by XYZ date that 
that kind of misses the the entire point of um, uh, of what burden reduction is meant to be. So, so if we look at prior auth from the IGs, right? And Bob did a great job of showing kind of how each step feeds the next, feeds the next, but offers kind of independent action depending upon your capability. And you know, we we kind of understand. We see the ordering provider. We order the the request. We collect all that data. You know, it's all great. Um, and technically, that process is there. But if you um, have been out in in the world working with providers like I have, um, you know, working on the payer side too, you'll see that probably this picture is a little bit closer <laughs> to what you might have experienced with PA. Uh, reams of paper flowing back and forth. Um, you know, and, and there, that paper might be electronic replacement. Um, it, it could be an electronic transaction. Um, but, you know, what you get into with a lot of these real world situations is not everybody is at the same level of adoption. So, you know, what if your EMR isn't fire compliant? Because even if there's an HTI rule, they decided not to be compliant for one reason or another. Um, what if providers are still using le legacy channels because they have you know, bought three or four different uh, locations and they all have different processes. So you've got three offices doing faxes and one office is using the electronic system. Um, you know, what if there's just no resources, right? You could have four offices all with just one person staffing all these processes, you know, from front to back, depending upon your location and, and what resources you have available. So, you know, how do you really, as a provider, um, you know, if you put that hat on, get your head around dealing with this change. And, um, you know, at the same time, understanding that this change is going to require you to evaluate your PA process potentially for every single payer you deal with. So if you're a highly diversified, you know, provider that's seeing lots of different members across lots of different, uh, you know, types of um, insurance, you know, you, you've got a lot to deal with and understand as far as even as much as we want to make the process the same, as several have alluded to, maybe Medicaid rules are different than your commercial rules. And we might get great adoption of the technology, but if the technology is adopted in such a way that all it really does is pushes the actual burden to another part of the process, we haven't really gained that much. So that's where, again, going back to that business transformation framework, you, you really have to think about this in terms of how can I make the whole thing better so that you don't inadvertently end up causing more of this, but maybe instead of paper flying around, it's five different versions of a, an implementation in your own EHR. You know, it, that's what we don't want to have happen, right? So that doesn't necessarily mean the standard is wrong. It just means that you have to deal with how am I working with this unstructured data today? How do I get it structured? Uh, I think as several have talked about, but doing it in such a way that benefits the entire process end to end. So just kind of revisiting the process, right? We've got our provider, front office staff, they're working with the patient. Do we need prior auth? Again, echoing, I think what Heidi was saying from a plan implementation perspective, this right here, if you did nothing else, adds tremendous benefit to the process if you can answer this question near real time. Um, and, you know, having had direct experience with trying to answer this question from both perspectives, uh, payer and vendor, um, you know, it is a difficult thing to, to deal with. Um, but presuming that, you know, you can figure that out, okay, now can I figure it out across all of my plans? Um, and if I can't, okay, well, now I'm dealing with somebody maybe that can call somebody because I don't have time to deal with this patient right now. So now the patient continues to wait. Um, you know, they're talking with people at the health plan, whether it's benefits or, um, you know, UM representatives, you know, this is where the delay, the frustration, you know, the, this kind of negative impact really starts coming to bear because, You've got now two people waiting on potentially a third person to have a conversation, um, you know, and or one person waiting at a desk, you know, it just it, it gets um, tiresome very quickly. Um, so then we finally get the answer. Now they can move on to their next step in care. Right. So in this case, you've likely got a sick member that needs care and doesn't even know whether they can get care, right? So that, that stress burden uh, that's impacting their overall health. I think this is 
ultimately what we're trying to solve, right? And, and the point is to say, yes, there are lots of cases where providers are not using portals. Why, if they're not using portals today, the natural outflow of that is why change to use something new that says supposedly is better than a portal, but the portals didn't bring me in a benefit. So why, why do this, right? Um, maybe the documentation needs from my perspective or, or as a provider are excessive, or we've even heard from some, you know, Hey, this doesn't make sense. This is inaccurate. And here's why, um, you know, many submissions are still being made via fax from, because that may be the most expeditious way to do it based upon the implementation. So uh, uh, anecdotally had one situation where, you know, major hospital was, I believe they were faxing in all of their authorizations initials, but they were doing all their updates online. But it was because they had figured out that it actually saved them more time and effort to collect the records and move them back to a manual channel than it did to try and work their records that were in their electronic system into the portal that was available to them. But on the flip side, it saved them a whole lot more time to use the features of that very same portal to update existing cases. So in that case, benefit to the provider and benefit to the member, but from the payer's perspective and the initial member experience, it's potentially slower than it could have been, but all ultimately because of what you could be argued is a valid reason on the, on the provider side, uh, as far as cost, uh, you know, control. So that again, goes back to the burnout, you know, you'll notice how all of these things, you know, as you look at these problems, patients and limited visibility, you know, they kind of all feed into one another, right? And you, you get these, you know, um, tensions that that pull at every um, every person in the process. So the point I want to make is, you know, there's still things you can do just because people are frustrated, right? Even if it's not something that, um, you know, the rule, like take for example, educating providers um, on automated PA value, right? Just because maybe your portal hasn't had the uptake that you would like to have, look at the rule, look at where it's going, stay engaged with your providers and say, hey, we as a payer are going to work on this because A, we're required to, but B, we think it's a good idea. So, you know, keep them engaged, make them understand what the benefits are as the rule is coming uh, to bear. Um, as far as the provider side, right? You've got an opportunity to work with your EMR vendors to implement these transactions to say, can I figure out this uh, this uh, coverage requirement burden? Uh, talk to some providers that maintain, you know, either uh, uh, playbooks that just have here's where here's what website I go to to check this payer's uh, PA requirements. So, you know, hundred page PowerPoint decks, uh, binders of information they get handed down from one person to another. Right? There's an opportunity to really make those processes all be streamlined, but you may have to go out and seek those integrations, right? It may not just come to you just because, um, especially with how these regulations tie together, right? If there are dates that don't necessarily align with when an EMR may be required to do something, it may be on you to go seek those things out if you really want to realize this value sooner. So um, another option that you know, you can really do on the payer side is say, hey, I'm getting intakes via fax right now, but we've got all this new OCR technology, but we haven't actually implemented it in our authorization channel. And given the fact that this is going to be a multi-year uh, implementation window, right, maybe it makes sense to do some investments now on that intake towards the uh, eventual back-end processing of these requests for is authorization required, right? So the more I can understand what types of services even, maybe even if it's just as simple as, hey, can I um, scan a, a, the cover sheet that I'm getting today and figure out what type of auth request I'm getting? You know, that's, that's something that will add value uh, to understanding the implementation environment you're in. So really looking at your existing channels and saying, is there something that you can do now? Don't just kind of toss it out because you feel like, oh, everybody will go electronic. I think you've heard enough today to hear that there's significant challenges, even with this technology, towards adoption and rolling it out at scale. So if there are things you can do now, don't hesitate to try and make the case for them because they, as long as you understand the context in which you're making that investment, 
it may yield uh, and probably will yield benefits down the line. So and another thing that you can do on the provider side is look at your existing processes, right? The, like the example I gave, right? Uh, all these provider systems, if there's merging, you know, large scale differences in what EMRs you've implemented, maybe this side of the business has Epic, this side of the business has Cerner, you know, whatever it might be, you really need to start understanding those processes now and looking for those efficiencies because this is the time to be really getting your strategy and your planning together so that you can have a successful implementation and kind of feeding back into start asking those questions about when our CRD API is available, you know, and can I start leveraging them so that I'm not caught flat footed at the very end and worst case scenario, you end up paying for functionality that you're not even using to its fullest extent because you haven't actually done the homework to know where you can implement them. Um, and on the patient side, right, that limited visibility, something that uh, payers can do and providers can do um, to a certain extent, uh, depending upon who's offering the technology, is updating the API, right? <laughs> Making sure that you've got to um, make that prior auth data available, but promoting the usage, right? Actually building features that leverage that data, right? So if there's another um, thing that you can do, maybe it's maybe you're getting phone calls from your um, patients about, hey, I have a pending prior authorization. What's the status of it? You should be able to integrate that feature directly into your member mobile app if you're a payer and say, hey, it looks like that uh, prior auth status is XYZ. Same thing for the provider side. With the capabilities of provider access API uh, will unlock, you can do the same into your patient-facing application. So there's many different ways that you could source this data to the patients so that they're actually getting these benefits rather than just looking at it from, a, oh, it's just another cost of doing business type implementation. Again, back to that mentality of put the patient first, try to answer the questions that they have and let it outflow from there. Um, and then, you know, lastly on this slide here, just looking at the new reporting data and the opportunities that that provides. So um, I think in the chat, we talked about this. I mentioned it when on the panel, you know, the reporting requirement really, if you look at it, starts in 25 because you have to collect all of the data to report yearly metrics in 26. So if you're actually looking at ways to build use cases internally and start saying, hey, you know, where is my spend actually at? How many authorizations am I getting? You know, this is a non-trivial task, especially with the segmentation that's required uh, within the rule. Um, you know, it may require you to make changes on how you're collecting data, how you're tracking authorizations internally, et cetera. So maybe that's the tip of the spear for you, right? So just the point of this is to all say, hey, there might be all kinds of excuses, maybe not to act yet, but there are mitigation strategies and or steps that I can take, even if the technology is not ready to actually implement things and start the ball rolling, um, you know, so that you don't end up caught behind the eight ball, so to speak. So, so just looking from a payer's perspective, right? If we're talking payer, uh, patient and uh, provider impacts, right? So in today's world, you have, you know, a situation, back up a slide here. So where maybe, and this is probably even generous, 2% of the transactions are happening with uh, a fire enabled EMR. You've got 30% happening with uh, legacy EMRs, maybe through 278s or something like that. Um, maybe 60% are coming out of the EMR, but are actually just turning into faxes. And then you've got providers that maybe are even phoning them in because they, maybe they don't have readily an easy way to fax that volume of records. You know, whatever that mix is, the point is you've got all these channels today. And as a payer, you're going to have all these channels tomorrow right? It's just going to be a change in the percentage of these channels and how they're actually um, really staffed and implemented um, from, a, from a staffing and backend standpoint. And don't forget that the, one of the first rules that goes into effect on 1126 is the turnaround time rule. So, you know, when you're looking at this, you could look for strategies such as okay, how do I take this backend data and maybe apply some AI NLP work to actually get the data in a structured format that is more friendly to usage within a fire context, right? So it's just 
it's just one idea. I mean, there's many others that you could do, but it's just thinking through the things that you can do to enable you to be ready for the future um, while you're still dealing with the reality that not everybody is going to be at the future at the same time. So as providers, right, the biggest thing I, I would kind of offer is embrace the change, right? You can be the change, live the change, you know, go out, look for those pilot programs um, for your vendors and your payers, you know, spend the time to understand the processes that are currently implemented. You know, if it's been a while since you checked in with, you know, the person that does prior offs at your satellite office, Now's the time to start asking those questions and understanding what's happening. You know, give feedback to the payers, right? Especially on the medical policy front. I, I think there was a, a lot of discussion around, you know, making automatable policies. Well, it, payers may not know that their policies are not automate, as automatable as they can be because they don't necessarily know the nuance of how you're interpreting them from a provider's perspective. So if you're looking at something, it's an evidence-based guideline, and it doesn't make sense to you, you know, make sure you're, you've got a dialogue with the UM organizations at the payers where you're seeing these issues, because the sooner they can start getting this feedback, the higher the likelihood is that as this transformation effort starts to kind of reach scale within that organization, they kind of realize, oh, these are the things we're hearing and these are the problems that we're having, right? Um, and, and this, again, ties back into that appeal metrics um, discussion, you know, because they're going to require reporting on a return appeals and things like that. You know, there is an incentive for payers to really look at this and say, are we doing this and putting our best foot forward and really trying to save, you know, everybody involved the burden that currently is brought with PA, um, but still have PA as a process, in, you know, in its meaningful place in the, in, in the overall ecosystem. Um, and then, you know, look at small scale changes, right? If, if you're looking at, you know, the PA requirements, say those are being tracked on post-it notes, um, you know, in your process today, Try to document who you're talking to and, you know, keep track of those conversations. Start coming up with kind of an understanding of how you even know whether or not the answers that you're going to get using this new technology are the ones you expect, right? Um, because as with any new change, there's always a chance that something could go awry. So understanding what your own expectations are and keeping your business flowing the way you would expect as we move into this kind of maturation of the technology will be key in keeping that feedback loop going so that when these implementations happen, just like I'm sure if those were involved in 4010 to 5010 or any of these implementations in the past, right? Payers are, are going to have some mechanism to deal with those types of issues. So you have an understanding of what you would expect is immensely helpful um, in helping the payers understand where the problems actually are. And then from a patient's perspective, I, I think I'd echo probably what Lorraine and, and CMS have been saying for, for years now, you know, own your data, right? If we're all patients in this ecosystem to a certain degree, I mean, even if, you know, you're on a commercial plan, you know, make it known, hey, I, I want this, right? Look for those applications and look for those features that you could generally assume would be using these APIs. You know, ask about the health record transfers under the payer to payer rule. Um, these, these are things that are meant to help ease the burden of patients at the end of the day. Um, and if you take an active role, it, it's kind of like retirement planning or something like that. It may not be your favorite activity and you might not want to think about all of these what if situations with the future, but it will pay off in the long run. And I think, you know, taking that same mentality about being a good steward of your data, understanding who has it, where it lives, how it can be used to, you know, your benefit to help your provider give you better care, to help your payer more easily administer, you know, your uh, particular set of circumstances, right? If they know what authorizations you already have from a prior plan, that is an immense help to the to the new payer, right? Um, so just all of those things, ultimately, the more people that are asking for them, the more chance there is they're going to be able to be implemented and be useful for you. Then lastly, this is just kind of a, a grid here if we're looking at providers, patients, and payer impacts, right? Um, we, we've got this, you know, I won't read them, uh, 
to the to the group because you know you all can read but just think about these types of situations and always be thinking about the three constituents that you're dealing with with every single part of the rule um, because that will ultimately, I think, help you be able to have these conversations internally and, you know, drive whatever your scope of this rule implementation may be will help you drive this because you'll kind of understand the key points. Um, and, you know, our, our goal as edifex in general is to help all of our customers, you know, work their way through this. Anybody that's interested in any aspect of this, always glad to help. But, you know, we're just trying to get the word out there and let you know that, you know, we are trying to think about this holistically and um, definitely would advocate that anybody and everybody that has a stake in this implementing this rule would do the same. So that is all my slides. I have not been watching the chat, so I don't know if there's any other questions or anything, uh, but... I'm not seeing any questions. Any questions for Brian? Feel free to uh, enter them in the chat. But not seeing that. Um, want to thank you, Brian. Excellent uh, presentation. And I think with that, Michael, we can go to our our final couple of slides. Oh, let me stop sharing. All right. Well, first of all, again, thank you, Brian, and your team at Edifax. You guys have been just tremendous partners with Weedy over many, many years. So much appreciated. And the same with M MCG as well. Um, I do encourage you um, on March 4th uh, from 1 to 3.30, we're going to do, uh, you got a preview of some of the discussion from, from Dave and Heidi uh, regarding um, what can we learn from the vendor side, but also uh, the folks that have actually started down this road. I think you'll find it extremely interesting. And then as I man man mentioned, we're going to do a, a, a focus on uh, small providers and small payers, uh, providers uh, March 21st and payers April 8th. And so if that's a, a, a constituency that's interesting to you, you'll definitely want to put it on your calendar. And next slide, Michael, if we, if we have one. If not, um, that's it. Okay, then I just want to take just two minutes and 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 thank a few folks. First of all, Lorraine and and Shanna, uh, wonderful that CMS is willing to partner with with Weedy and help educate the industry on these very important rules. And uh, Bob, thank you again for sharing your expertise as well as Mark, uh, it's invaluable to have the folks that actually uh, wrote these implementation guides to answer questions and address comments. I also wanted to thank um, Rebecca, Andrea, David, Danielle, John, Heidi, Heather, uh, uh, Chuck, and Diana for uh, their willingness to, again, to participate on the panel and uh, share their their thoughts and perspectives. So with that, uh, I just wanna thank um, our own Michael McNutt. As always, he does a phenomenal job with running these events. And uh, we look forward to seeing you all at the next event on March 4th. And with that, we'll close the, uh, close the program. Have a good afternoon. <laughs>